Okay, good evening, everyone. We're gonna move on a little bit more into uh, the screening discussion, some more uh, upfront diagnostic type areas. Um, I really like Dr. Wise's talk, but it really r pertains more towards advanced treatment for prostate cancer. I wanna talk about more about the diagnosis and treatment and it's kind of the entry level where we're at and some of the advances we're making on that. So, you know, it's a really rapidly changing landscape for a lot of cancers based on what Dr. Weiss just highlighted. There are many different advances, especially with immunotherapy and immunology as well. Uh, but in, in addition to that, we have a lot of advances going on, and I think a very rapidly changing field for prostate cancer screening and diagnosis. And I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the areas that we're focusing on here at NYU involving imaging and improving our understanding of the prostate gland through uh, MRI. Uh, but just some overview, as I'm sure you're all aware, you know, prostate cancer, even in 2017, we uh, expected about 161,000 men to be diagnosed in the United States. And that incidence of diagnoses have been increasing, and they took a very large jump back in the early 90s when we introduced PSA screening. And I'm going to go into this in a little bit of detail, but over that time period, we saw a vast increase in the amount of men being diagnosed with prostate cancer, and also a decrease in the average age at which men were diagnosed. So there was what we call a stage migration with the introduction of PSA. And this is really important for what we're dealing with in terms of prostate cancer management today. And I'll go into exactly why. Even though 161,000 men are diagnosed with prostate cancer, only one in seven, or one in seven are diagnosed roughly, about one in 30 actually die from the disease. So we're actually diagnosing quite a few prostate cancers, but only a small percentage or proportion of those men actually have prostate cancer that I would I'll call aggressive or clinically um, uh, actionable disease that we need to try and prevent. What there is, is is a large diagnosis of what we would call low grade or indolent prostate cancer that the PSA screening test appears to have uh, increased. Now what is the goal of a screening test for prostate cancer or any cancer? It's to optimize detection of a potentially aggressive, potentially lethal cancer at a state in which you could treat it and therefore prevent the uh, development of a lethal or a metastatic state. Identifying it at a point in which doing that treatment will actually provide benefit. If the prostate cancer has already spread and we identify it and there aren't any treatments that can delay its further progression, then that screening test is not very effective. And so we will also, there's a flip side to what would make the ideal screening test. We want to minimize the detection of low risk disease for which the identification of it creates more harm than good. And this is really where I think we got into trouble with PSA. As we started to pick up, like I said, there are one out of every seven men were diagnosed, but only one out of 30 needed treatment. And so therefore our treatments, the traditional treatments carried a fairly high burden of toxicity for urinary control and sexual function. So we identify these uh, situations where the PSA raises an alarm, we find a small, low-grade or indolent prostate cancer, and we embark on a whole gland treatment. So touch a little bit upon some of the concepts that Dr. Wise mentioned, and this is what about prostate cancer as a hereditary disease. Uh, if you have one first-degree relative, you have a two times incidence of developing prostate cancer. So this is important for screening. So we need to look at your family history. You need to be aware if you have relatives who've been uh, diagnosed with prostate cancer because it does make an impact on whether or not you should have PSA screening, maybe also the frequency and the timing of that PSA screening. If you have two or more relatives that were diagnosed with prostate cancer, that risk, relative risk can increase by fourfold. So these are all important things to be aware of. Uh, however, the truth about the hereditary aspect of prostate cancer is it's not that well understood. I can't tell you 
if you had a specific gene in your family, then you would be absolutely uh, guaranteed to have prostate cancer, but we do have some emerging knowledge of this, and Dr. Wise also highlighted that. So hereditary prostate cancer is estimated to occur in about 10% of the cases, okay? And in men who are diagnosed with early onset prostate cancer, and I'm talking in the 40s, early 50s, it's roughly 40% of those cases are estimated to be of a hereditary nature. And we talked, Dr. Wise also mentioned this, this is the BRCA1 and 2 mutations. This is something we do have a little bit more information on. This does, if it is carried in the family, increase your risk of being a prostate cancer, um, being diagnosed with prostate cancer at some point. That relative risk is related to uh, your age, but it's about 4.5 times normal or the general population if you have the BRCA1 mutation. And it's anywhere, depending on the study, between 2.5 to 8.6 times normal for BRCA2 carriers. So I actually do have men referred to me whose uh, mother, aunt, sister had breast or ovarian cancer, were found to be BRCA1 or 2 positive, get genetic testing and find out they carry this mutation as early as 25 years of age, you may learn that. The, the risk with BRCA1 and 2 is that it's a very early onset malignancy for the women that get it. This is why you see women do bilateral mastectomy and uh, remove their ovaries in certain situations in order to try and prevent this because it's hard it, with a BRCA1 and 2 mutation, it tends to be very aggressive. So even early diagnostic screening techniques may not identify the disease at a state in which you could, like I mentioned earlier, the optimal goal to prevent spread and action. So translating that over to prostate cancer, it does appear BRCA1-2 mutations also relate to an early and aggressive prostate cancer. We do not, and I don't know of any real literature to support removing your prostate prophylactically, all right, because it's a lot different Maybe not a lot different, but it does have a different impact than, especially for younger men, than uh, bilateral mastectomies and, and uh, um, GYN organs. Very important to keep it in mind in terms of screening. So more and more people are undergoing genetic testing. In fact, it's commercially available, and you see commercials about this. Go ahead and do 23andMe or XYZ. I mean, there's a number of these packages that are available now. Uh, and I can't comment on their validity, but they may test for your risk of having a BRCA1 or 2 mutation. And if it were to come back positive, I think it would be informative that you would then have a higher risk of being diagnosed with prostate cancer. So it might affect screening. It is not, though, at this point, a routine screening tool. We've known about this for a long time. There are ethnic and racial differences in how prostate cancer presents. And we don't quite understand the etiology and the rationale behind this. It appears that in the African-American men in United States studies, that there is a higher likelihood of being diagnosed with prostate cancer and a higher rate of high risk disease at the time of prostate cancer. Interestingly, in Asian culture, China, Japan, Korean studies, in Asia, the rates of prostate cancer tend to be very low. However, Asian men living in the United States have a similar rate of prostate cancer as non-Asian men in the United States. It asks the question, or begs the question, is there a significant environmental factor in our cultural environment that raises those men's risk to a higher level than it would be in the Asian culture. Also getting back to what Dr. Wise was talking about, about those epigenetic changes. Again, this is very much something that's at the hypothesis stage right now, and I can't use that to improve my screening techniques, but it is something to be aware of. Dietary and modifiable risk factors. Not a lot of great data here, and I'm just going to touch upon a few points, but 
eating things such as uh, isoflavonoids. These have been shown to decrease or inhibit 5-alpha reductase. 5-alpha reductase is a hormone that converts testosterone to dihydrotestosterone at the level of the prostate. This can actually result in shrinkage of the prostate. This is actually inhibiting that enzyme is the primary method and mechanism and mode of action of finasteride, which is also Propecia. Uh, it is all Proscar. It's the active ingredient for those medications, which both shrink the prostate but also can prevent hair loss. So men do use those uh, for those purposes. What's interesting is there are two uh, large studies looking at 5-alpha reductase inhibitors where they showed that men on those medications that underwent prostate biopsy were found to have higher rates of prostate cancer detection that was higher risk or higher grade. However, the overall detection risk of prostate cancer in those men was lower than the general population and lower than what we, we expected. So in, initially, they thought, oh, maybe this is a chemo prevention tool, but it looks like the men who were diagnosed had higher grade disease, so the FDA now has a black box warning on that. Where that fits into the data off the foods that seem to inhibit 5-alpha reductase is unclear, but those are cruciferous vegetables primarily as well as beans, okay? Lycopene is present in tomatoes. There was a lot of, uh, maybe about 10 years ago, a lot more uh, excitement about lycopene as a way to try to reduce risk for prostate cancer. Some of the studies are small and don't particularly uh, show strong evidence for this. And then, as you had mentioned earlier, statin drugs have been shown in some studies to be involved in being a protective factor. Chronic inflammation is a proposed risk factor. Now, as we age, men's prostates grow, and there is a fairly high rate of prostatitis, both chronic and acute, sometimes bacterial, sometimes non-bacterial. And what that means is it's not always something that gives you a fever, but it gives you lower urinary tract symptoms. The prostate is an organ which is full of ducts and glands, and it's uh, responsible for making semen, as we all know. But a lot of these ducts and glands can become blocked as it grows over time. Think of fibroids in the uterus. As they grow for women, they can become quite large. The prostate can do the same thing. And therefore, it can block some of these ducts. They can become inflamed. And it can create a local inflammatory response. If that remains chronic, that, the hypothesis is, may result in an environment in which you can get tumor development. This has been shown in other types of cancers. One of the per pertinent urologic cancers is, for example, uh, if you were, grew up in Egypt where there's a high rate of uh, schistosomiasis, which is a parasite in the water, it very commonly gets into the bladder. And these parasites actually create a local inflammatory response. And if that chronically persists, there's a hot, much higher rate of bladder cancer formation in these bladders. So the hypothesis is, holds true in other organs. So, I think there is something to this for prostate cancer as well. This relates to our screening because PSA testing is influenced by inflammation. It will go up and down just from inflammation of the prostate, which obscures our screening test, which is one of the main reasons it's not that accurate for screening. So as I had mentioned earlier, what is our primary screening tool with PSA? What is PSA? PSA is prostate-specific antigen. It is an enzyme in the semen that liquefies the semen. That's what it does. Where did it come from? Why did we use it? It was developed out of forensic science, where it was being used initially in Japan to trace rape and sexual assault victims and then being used to identify uh, that it was a true sexual assault, because you could then say this was absolutely from semen. And that's where the enzyme was initially identified. Turns out then it also could be translated to a blood test. And from that blood test, you could start to infer information about the prostate gland. The FDA approved it in the United States to be used as a prostate cancer screening tool very early on without really strong studies to show whether that screening tool helped. But it took off, and that relates to that concept that I explained very early on where we saw this massive increase in the incidence of prostate cancer in the United States. 
and all over the world, actually. It's simply because it's a blood test, so it's very readily available, but it is not exactly specific to prostate cancer. And I tell patients this all the time. PSA comes from the prostate cells, not prostate cancer cells. Yes, prostate cancer cells will make PSA, but all prostate cells will make PSA, malignant and non-malignant. So it's prostate specific. So if you have a prostate, you're gonna make PSA for the most part. If you have no prostate, your PSA should be undetectable. If you have no prostate cells, it makes sense. So as a screening tool, it's very good at telling you we absolutely know you have prostate cells. But as a screening tool, it's not very useful for saying you have prostate cancer. That being said, what did we have before it? Nothing. We had digital rectal exam. So what did you present with before PSA? Symptoms. If you present with prostate cancer symptoms, the likelihood that it's local to the prostate gland, very low. It's most likely metastatic at that point. And so at that time, surgery was one of the only options. Radiation was one of the only options. And the surgery, because the prostate cancers were very advanced, had to be an advanced surgery, a very what we call radical surgery. So in order to try to get out all of the tumor, you had to do a wider cancer surgery. And the rates of incontinence and impotence were very high. In fact, the rates of injury to the rectum were very high just because these tumors were very large when they presented. Now, PSA resulted in a lot of men being diagnosed with prostate cancer, but they were very small tumors. They were just in the prostate. Many of them were Gleason 6. But we said, look, these are prostate cancers. And so a lot of men underwent the same treatments that we had had to treat those prostate cancers. And over time, studies were performed to say, does this screening decrease mortality? And that's actually a very central controversy to the to the uh, prostate cancer management. With PSA screening, 90% or more of the men have the cancer just in the prostate, so it's not spread. We know that, and that's very good. Um, th this did drastically change the field. This allowed us to develop better techniques for surgery. When you don't have prostate cancer, that's bulky and left the prostate gland. It allowed Patrick Walsh at Hopkins to really perfect what we call the nerve sparing technique of radical prostatectomy. It allowed radiation therapies to advance and now we have things such as SBRT or stereotactic body radiotherapy which is also heavily advertised as CyberKnife, which are more focused treatments to the gland. You can do that because the tumors are smaller. If we had bigger tumors without the screening, then all the treatments have to be wider. So this is what the stage migration of the screening really ended up developing. So what are those impacts? Improvements in the rates of organ-confined disease. Do men die from prostate cancer in the PSA screening era? Yes, but it's one in 30, whereas before the PSA screening era, it was much higher. Right now, five and 10 year disease specific survival for prostate cancer, if it was PSA screen detected, is around 99% at five years and 91% all comers. So these are good numbers. It's more, well, more or less well controlled in that setting. In the 80s, before PSA, you would look at a biochemical recurrence free survival rate, meaning that the PSA levels after treatment were not measurable around 23%. And it came down, it added about, it went down to about 13% after PSA screening was introduced. So there was an impact. All this points towards, it looks like PSA should play out as an improval in survival. And then the prostate cancer specific mortality in the PSA screening area right now, meaning if it was detected by PSA level, we did a biopsy and it was then found to be prostate cancer just in the gland, this is called clinical stage T1C, which is the primary rate at which most diagnoses are made. It, the 15-year prostate cancer-specific mortality is 6%. 15 years. It's a long time. 94% success rate. So that looks great. So we should all sit back and say, well, look, it looks like it's doing something. The problem is, if you would randomize those men, 
and look at whether or not the men who didn't get the screening died faster, they don't. So it's very tricky. There are two trials that were published right around 2010, 2011. These are the two trials, the prostate, the lung, colorectal, and ovarian screening trial, which was the United States trial to try and randomize men and see if the screening tests were actually improving death from prostate cancer. And then there was what we call the ERSPC trial, which is the European version of the same concept. And the American trial did not show an improvement, but it was heavily flawed. Many men in the group that were supposedly not screened underwent PSA screening. It's an extremely flawed trial. Drawing conclusions from the trial is very difficult. Basically a long-term trial, 11 years, that ended up not showing anything. It's a big waste, unfortunately. European trial did show an improvement, but it looked like you'd need to screen 50 men to decrease death for prostate cancer for one man, which becomes extremely, uh, well, it becomes, in terms of an epidemiologic perspective, not very effective. It doesn't look like a good tool. That data has improved as that trial has, has matured. So it does look like the European trial was better performed and their screening rates were better in their screening arms versus their non-screening arms. And they do show that that number has improved over time. But again, it takes on the order of 15 years to start seeing these effects because prostate cancer is by and large being detected very early with PSA. So the disease lifespan is very long. So in order to really detect a difference, you need to see a long period of follow-up data, which is hopefully the next five to 10 years, we'll have even more information on it, but we're talking five to 10 more years. So small volume, low grade disease, this is a very interesting corollary. The men that are diagnosed with PSA screening have small, low volume disease primarily, and I'm talking about Gleason 6. There's two studies that I'm gonna quote right here, which comprise about 26,000 men. 0.2% at 20 years of those men developed metastatic prostate cancer that resulted in mortality. There were in the 14,000 case, the first one, the case series up here, the first one, 22 cases of men in 14,000 men with Gleason 6 that actually were found to have lymph node metastases. It's an astonishingly low rate of spread from those cancers. Those 22 cases, they went back and re-looked at the tumor in the prostates from those men, and it turns out they were undergraded on their pathology and actually had higher grades. So actually, some urologists and some medical oncologists will say that Gleason 6 disease cannot kill you, shouldn't be called cancer. Still somewhat controversial, and we do not believe that's 100% true. There is still metastatic potential in Gleason 6, but it's very, very low. So this led to this headline, which I'm sure you're all aware of. This was back on October 6, 2011, and we were all told PSA is a terrible test. The screening for prostate cancer using this test shouldn't be performed. The United States panel that they're referring to is the United States Preventative Health Services Task Force. They grade and provide recommendations on screening tests that then Medicare will determine whether or not they will pay for. Why is that important? If Medicare says we, that test is no good because the United States Preventative Health Service Task Force says it doesn't work, we won't pay for it. Every other insurance company in line says, well, if Medicare won't pay for it, we won't pay for it. And where, where do we go with that? Right back to digital rectal exams, truly. So it was clear we needed better science, we needed better studies, but they take 15 years. We don't have 15 years. This is another very interesting trial. It was published two years ago in October of 2016. This is called the PROTECT-T trial. This is a very good trial because they actually ran it right. In the United Kingdom, they took all these men that were coming in with PSA-detected prostate cancer, and they said, okay, well, you have prostate cancer. It looks like it's low-grade, low-volume. We want you to be part of our trial. You, have, you go into the trial, you're going to get randomized to a treatment. The treatments are 
You may get surgery, you may get radiation, which we know are the standard of care treatment, or we may just watch you. No one in the surgery group or the radiation group, for the most part, died from prostate cancer in a 10-year period. Treatments worked. The problem is, no one in the watch group also died in the, in the, in the study. But this is the important, tri or important slide from the study in terms of the screening as aspect. In the lower line here, which is the active monitoring group, roughly 50% of those men in the 10-year period ended up developing some clinical feature that meant they needed to be treated. So there's something wrong in our screening test because it's not picking up the men who are at risk. Sure, if you treat all the men, they won't die from prostate cancer in that 10-year period, but the, of the men that you didn't treat, some of them progress. And all of the deaths in the study actually fell into the active monitoring group. So there's something wrong with our PSA screening. So how do we improve the diagnostic approach? PSA is a useful tool. Like I said, get away from the digital rectal exam as our only tool. PSA is the next best step. Now, how can we improve PSA? There's a form of PSA called percent-free PSA. This actually is more specific for prostate cancer on a few large studies performed by Bill Catalona, who's at Northwestern, and he took a large cohort of men that he had taken their prostates out, looked back at their PSA, looked at the percent-free PSA, which is the unbound PSA in the blood, and it was more specific for if you underwent biopsy, finding cancer. The problem is all of these studies were done in the era where even the low volume Gleason 6s were being removed. So his algorithms from that would tell you, what's your risk of having any prostate cancer on a biopsy, even the kind of prostate cancer that will not cause a problem. And then we can use it to give you a better risk assessment. It helps, it's readily available, it's not expensive, and we can do it right away. It only works if your PSA is between four and 10. All the studies were between four and 10. If you have a PSA of 2, it doesn't work. If your PSA is 15, it's not relevant. But it does help. Now, there are novel markers that really kind of stem from the same concept that are available off blood tests. There's what we call the prostate health index, or PHI score, and then there's one called the 4K score. These tests are looking at isoforms of the PSA in the blood, very similar concept to the percent-free PSA. They are isoforms that are more specific for prostate cancer. Now why PHI and 4K are better than percent free is because they're looking for the type of cancer that is aggressive. PCA3 is a urine marker. Someone mentioned earlier a liquid biopsy. This gets to the same concept. PCA3 is an expression of mRNA in the urine so a man would undergo a rectal exam with a vigorous prostate massage. What that does is it expresses prostatic secretions into the urethra. You urinate afterwards, and that urine sample, you collect it. In that urine is going to be prostatic secretions. That test looks at those and looks for RNA or DNA expressed by cancer cells. And it's very specific, PCA3, for cancer. But we've got a problem with it. It's not aggressive cancer. It can pick up low grade, low volume cancer. Select MDX is a newer version of this, and it is supposed to be more specific. I don't have much clinical experience with it yet. I do think that we will be doing more work with it in the future, and I've put in some requests for trials on some of these other biomarkers. We call them biomarkers. Now there's another aspect that I think is underutilized, which is very important, and this is a very simple test. It's called PSA density. What this means is, since PSA is made by all prostate, if your prostate's in place, if you have a 500 cc prostate gland, the size of like a small soccer ball, you're gonna make more PSA than if you have a peanut prostate. But the problem is our other P P test, PSA, just as a straight PSA test, doesn't take that into consideration. So we say if your PSA is four or higher, that's abnormal. Well, if you have the soccer ball prostate, you're always going to be over four. That doesn't mean you have prostate cancer. 
And if you have a peanut-sized prostate, you should probably have a threshold of one or something like that. You know, we don't know. So what we need to do is normalize the PSA for the amount of prostate tissue you have. And that's where PSA density comes in. So if you know how much prostate you have, you take your PSA and divide it by that, and this can improve it as a screening tool. So it needs to be, or should be, less than 0.15. If it is, you're making prostate-specific antigen in a rate that we would expect for the amount of prostate that you have. If it's over that, then you're overproducing PSA for the amount of prostate you have. Why is that a trigger? Well, cancer is a proliferation of cells. It's an uncontrolled proliferation of cells. So if the cells are spreading or multiplying quickly, they're making more PSA. Can also be set off as a false positive by inflammation, right? So again, it's not perfect. kind of went through these. These are your markers. Okay, so ultimately what was the biggest problem that wasn't addressed by all these biomarkers is if your PSA comes back high or there's a suspicion, and I don't care which test you use, even today with 4K or with Select MDX or PCA3, this picture right here on the right of the screen is what you end up needing. And that's a transrectal ultrasound prostate biopsy. This technology hasn't improved in 30 years. Think about what kind of phone you were using 30 years ago. <laughs> so the ultrasound looks at the prostate and cannot tell you normal versus abnormal, not with any reliability. So when we first employed ultrasound over 30 years ago, it was very good at saying there's the prostate, which before we had no imaging to say that. So we started to sample using that because before that we'd have to stick our finger, urologists literally would have to stick their finger into the rectum and slide a needle along your finger and then try to capture the prostate biopsy. So a lot of gloves got captured in sampling biopsies and you could easily, you know, include your own finger tissue in the biopsy. Not directed, very difficult to reproduce, and this is a very substantial improvement to use ultrasound to guide it. Because what we could say is, we'll use the ultrasound to say, I'm gonna biopsy from the right side, I'm gonna biopsy from the left side, I'm gonna biopsy from the base and the apex, and this was an improvement. But here's what happened with that. Many studies looked at what the cancer detection rate was as you kept sampling, and it hit essentially a plateau. This is if you would take men with an elevated PSA and biopsy them with six samples, you had around a 26% rate of diagnosis. But if you upped it to 24, it went to 47. So that's an improvement, but it plateaus. This doesn't make a big jump. It doesn't linearly improve. So it's essentially a blind biopsy. So there are a number of limitations to this standard biopsy. Important tumors are missed. You're not guiding towards any one thing. 30% of the clinically significant tumors are missed on the first biopsy. And doing a repeat biopsy in the same fashion, it only has a cancer detection improvement less than 20%. So again, we're just falling bad by bad. 40% of the time, if you had a diagnosis of prostate cancer on your 12 core random sampling, and you went and had your prostate removed, you had more or worse disease than we thought. Undergrading was a major problem. I don't know if anyone here is a fan of the British office, but David Brent, one of his quotes in that show is, a good idea is a good idea forever. And we have to always challenge ourselves to not get into that rut. And I think what happened for many years is we had this easy test and we just kept using it and we recognized there were limitations, but it needed to be fixed. And finally, and this was uh, uh, highlighted about 10 years ago by Patrick Walsh, the father of the nerve sparing prostatectomy, where he said that the greatest improvement in prostate cancer management would be the development of an imaging study that actually accurately localized the disease in the prostate. Prostate cancer is even now, to this day, the only cancer in the body that the only way we really know where the disease is is after we take the prostate out. It's crazy. Now we have this, though. This makes all the difference. 
And why is this in a screening lecture? Well, this is in the screening lecture because this is truly where screening sh will probably be going. This is an MRI of the prostate. Look at this picture, it's really nice. This is a man lying down in the MRI scanner, and you can see here's the urinary bladder, here's the prostate gland, these are the hip bones, this is the rectum. The anatomy is very clear, very, very well defined. This is dramatically better than that ultrasound picture. We call it multiparametric uh, prostate MRI. What does that mean? There's different sequences. The first sequence is called T2-weighted imaging of the prostate. This is that picture I just showed you. It's very anatomical. It shows you all the structures. It shows you where they are in relation to each other. It gives you a very accurate estimation of the prostate's size. In that sequence, if it's dark, it's suspicious. So see the back side of the prostate here? See how there's a dark spot? That's potentially a suspicious area. Here's another one. Here's another one. The next sequence is what we call diffusion-weighted imaging. Diffusion-weighted imaging means that the MRI is looking at protons in the body. It's a magnet. It's not radiation. It's a magnet. And it looks at protons, which are essentially water molecules, right? And it looks at where there are more or less what we call Brownian motion. Brownian motion is the random motion of particles in space. If you look through the, the, the window when the sun's coming through, the reason it's called Brownian motion, there was a physicist back in the 1800s named Brown who he did defined the way dust particles would move in the air when he observed them going in through the sunlight. They kind of just randomly move. That's Brownian motion. In our bodies, Protons have Brownian motion. In our prostates, there's an expected amount of motion of those protons. If there's a tumor where the glands are uh, poorly formed and clustered, and there's a lot of extra cells, the protons don't move as much. So we call this restricted diffusion. It's essentially looking at where there's more cellular density. So that initial sequence showed you the anatomy. This gives you a functional con component. Cells aren't moving, cells are clustered, and the protons aren't moving well. This is what it looks like here on the right. You see how it matches up. The T2 imaging shows me some dark spots. Here we have restricted diffusion in the same spot. Now we start to say, hmm, maybe something's there. Look on this spot of the prostate here. See how this is dark? Okay, so that raised some suspicion on the T2, but there's no restricted diffusion there. So that's less suspicious. Finally, there's what we call dynamic contrast enhancement. This is based upon the fact that as a tumor grows, what it does is it incorporates blood vessels into its uh, microenvironment. It's angiogenic, that's what we call it. This is actually the basis of a number of chemotherapy and what we call targeted therapies that um, are not typically used for prostate cancer but are used for other cancers like kidney cancer. If you could block the formation of these new blood vessels, the tumors will starve. But what this means for prostate MRI is you take an IV, put a medication in the IV, and then take a picture of the MRI, and areas that have more blood vessels will look like they take it up more quickly, and then because they have more blood vessels, they also wash it out more quickly. So this actually is the final piece of the multiparametric MRI to say this is a tumor. This puts it all together for you. Here's a T2-weighted image, dark spot, which I circled in red. This is restricted diffusion, same spot, dark spot. Here is a perfusion map after the gadolinium or the contrast enhancement. I know it's a busy sequence, but what you're really looking to see is does it match up in all three? And so the radiologist would interpret this and say, yep, there's something there. And they give it a score. They give it a score called the PIRAD score. That score can go from one to five. A PIRAD score of one is a normal looking prostate. Risk of having cancer in that is less than 5%. It's not zero. Very important to know, it's not zero. The other score is two through five. As it increases, the probability that there's cancer in that region increases. So this is a drastic improvement in our ability to image the prostate over the ultrasound images that I showed you earlier. This is a study that was published in 2014. 
by one of our colleagues in the Netherlands. The Netherlands and the Dutch, as well as the, the uh, several groups in the United Kingdom, really are some of the pioneers of a lot of this work that we've partnered with here at NYU. But they showed on this what we call meta-analysis that the overall specificity and sensitivity of the MRI to detect prostate cancer outperforms any of those blood tests that I showed you earlier in the urine tests. All those quote unquote biomarkers don't even compare to this. So that's great. What else can we do to improve screening? Well, we can target those MRI findings. And this is a, a picture of the device that we use to do this at NYU. This is called the Artemis, the Greek goddess of the hunt. I think that's why they named it that. I don't know. I've never asked them. What this is, is it's an MRI ultrasound fusion platform. It takes those MRI pictures that I showed you and allows me to then translate those to the ultrasound device that we utilize for the prostate biopsy. Why is that important? Well, if we didn't have this and we went just off the MRI, we'd have to sort of blindly guess where it is off the MRI report and looking at the pictures. This actually takes the MRI, makes a model, and then takes the ultrasound, makes a model, and fuses them so I know which spot is which and allows me to improve my biopsy by going directly to that area. Otherwise, you'd have to go into the MRI scanner and in the MRI scanner try to biopsy it under live MRI, which is very difficult because, like I said, it's a magnet, and taking all that equipment in, it has to be very specialized. It takes a much longer process. It's very uncomfortable, and it's not as easily available for men. And we have, like I showed you, 161,000 men per year being diagnosed. So if you can imagine all those men going in the MRI scanner, it would be a long time. Now, this is back to the concept of the PIRAD score. On the left here are the PIRAD scores 2 through 5 and the cancer detection rate using targeted biopsy. So as soon as it gets to a 5, we're talking 94% in our series, on the targeted biopsy we're found to have prostate cancer. And what's also very important about that is if you look at this substratified by whether or not it's the important types of prostate cancer, Gleason 7 or higher, not those low grade, low volume, we are finding more of those with the targeted biopsies, especially in these PIRADS 5s and the 4s. That's really where we're picking up the disease, identifying the aggressive disease much sooner, localizing it better. So to update where we're at, looking back at that 2011 proclamation by our friends of the United States Health Service Preventative Task Force, they said, stop using PSA. Well, they backtracked. There was a lot of pushback, came out a lot of uh, patient advocacy groups, the urologists, the American Urologic Association said, look, taking us back to just digital rectal exams, not going to be sufficient. So in 2017, they took the grade for the PSA screening back up to C. And what did they say? It's very important. They say men 55 to 69 should be offered the screening. It should be a discussion and it should be Involved, included in that discussion is a, a explanation of what it means to undergo a biopsy, what it means of potential risks and harms, and what does it mean to find on that biopsy low-grade, small-volume prostate cancer that we ordinarily now do not treat. So that's all very important. They do think that, and they do feel strong, that men over 70 likely do not need PSA screening anymore. I don't necessarily agree with that, but that's where they, they come down now. The American Urologic Association echoes these uh, response, or this, this approach. Uh, we have a, a slightly different um, threshold at eight different ages. We would say men in their 70s should be screened, but we've changed the threshold of what's an abnormal PSA. It's much more, um, it's much wider range. We'd say it's about 10. If it's over 10, you definitely need a biopsy. But under 10, then you need to take into consideration other, th other things, such as 10-year expected life expectancy and other things like that. It tries to you know, put this into the patient-specific context. So that's really the update on screening that I could provide right now. There is emerging biomarkers that I think are encouraging. But ultimately, I think the MRI is trumping everything. We ran a nomogram study here at NYU where we looked at all these factors, 
PCA3, PSA, family history, age, what your digital rectal exam looked like, and then ultimately, what was the PIRAD score on your MRI? And then we said, if you put all those into an algorithm, which predicts whether a biopsy will be positive for Gleason 7? MRI. What's the difference between a PIRAD score and a Gleason score? Gleason score is a pathologic score off the biopsy. It's a cancer uh, grade. A PIRAD score is a suspicion score on an image set. Okay, thank you.